My next question is, is how do you qualify investors? Everybody's in the room looking at this and many are saying, yeah, I'm interested, but you don't quite know what. How do you separate the ones that you think are really going to move forward and do something versus those that are, are really not? What do you do for that? Um, I put them, I mean, for, first for me, it's body language. If they're like trying to pull away or something, that means they haven't done anything. Um, that means they're just, they're just there for the free brownies or the beer or the cap, you know, the happy hour and everything. And that's usually your lower tier ones. But I just start asking the questions, but not in a very interrogative way, but in a very passive way. Like what, have you invested in a, in a private placement before? How did that go? How did you get that? You know, where did, where did you source that deal from? Uh, and then, you know, what are the size checks that you write? You always want to be direct. What are the size checks? Where is this capital coming from? You know, this is, you know, is this your capital or is this, you know, someone else's? Are you pooling it together or do you have to go out and call it? You know, have you ever done this before? <laughs> you know, you want to stay away from people who are like first time trying to be capital formation guys. Um, that'll get them into trouble. What you want to do is you want to just focus on them and say, just ask the, the, the real questions. It's like, how much have you invested before? So when you look at ticket sizes that you write for a company like mine, what would that look like? And just let them talk. You have to ask the questions and make, and, and keep the relationship going. The problem is, is that if you don't, then you know there you, 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 you might not get in contact with that guy again. So what I do is I always make sure that people, you know, I get their contact information and I follow up with them. And if they don't follow up, that's fine. I know that they're, you know, got other things to do, or they got too much on their plate, or maybe they're not real. But I would only take their business card only after I qualify them and say, hey, this is, you know, where's this money coming from? You know, how much do you usually, what's your average ticket size to something like this? Have you been, have you ever invested in a, in, in a private company before like this? What are your expectations on a company like this? You know, um, and, and really you want to weed out the ones who don't sound like they've been watching binge watching shark tank if that makes sense because right. they don't i don't think they have a real good grasp of reality about how you know things really work in the in the real world of venture and angel investing too well at what point in the process do you ask for that number you know are you in for 50 100 or sometimes do you start with the range and you then narrow it no, from there no 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 so i always have a minimum so the minimum of something that we have and, and you have to start out high on this is uh for thrive it's two hundred thousand dollars okay now if people are like Oh, shoot. I only have 50. Well, all right. Maybe we can cobble together a couple 50s with each. You know, maybe we can find some friends. But, you know, the CEO really wants whole numbers here. I hope you understand, Hall. You know, I might not be able to take it. But you have to start out high because that also gives a higher perceived barrier to entry. It also shows that there's a lot more legitimacy in the offer, especially if you're working with CEOs like ours. But it also it, it it's not it changes the frame of the conversation to do I want to invest to. Now I really want to invest because I can't get it. And do you have to sign the term sheet before they look at the diligence box just to enforce a little bit more interest and commitment to it? No, no, I don't. Okay. Do you ever use DocuSign or any tools like that to sign these Always. term sheets? Always. Yeah. Always. We love, we, it's a pain. Um, right now we're actually switching over to a new service, um, which is a fund administrator service. So um, they have their, not expensive, but they're not cheap either. But they're, you know, your founders don't need them unless you're managing money. They're called NAV Consulting, uh, navconsulting.net. They're based out in Chicago. And they they do all the documents and everything now. But there's software you can use. But if you're starting out, you can just do it with DocuSign um, or Adobe or anything like that. You want digital records of everything. It's easier that way to just pull up. And um, I would also, you know, if you're doing this and you're fundraising full time and as a CEO and a founder, you should be. That's your job is to always be raising capital besides building your business. Um, and you'll learn that, you know, that people who fail always say, I wish I raised more capital. I learned how to raise more capital. That's the reason why they fail sometimes. I mean, good people who had a business that was going is that they just didn't understand that you have to light the candle at both ends or have someone that's business development for you raising capital. But you always have to be in the business of raising capital. And I would invest in a CRM so that you can send out emails to people. Because if they write you a check once, they'll probably write you a check again. Right. Well, I talked to an experienced founder once, and he said, it's always baby steps in fundraising. You never ask them to do more than one thing, but you're always asking them to do something in every call, every word. You're just moving them from one step to the next. What's your take on that? Uh, I agree. I, you know, that's why we send a lot of emails. I force them to open the emails. I for, you know, they're, they're making a micro commitment by reading the email and they know that I'm on top of them or I'm giving them good news or not good news or other news or whatever. That's what I do. I'm never asking them to do anything, you know, 
I, that I wouldn't ask him to do, but I would say, look, Paul, I know you've expressed a lot of interest in this. Can you come in for a hundred thousand? I can match it. I need you to come in. We're so close. That's really what it comes down to. You have to offer the number out there. If they can't do that, then it comes down. If you say, well, what can you put in? They're going to come up with a low ball offer that doesn't show any commitment on their end, like $10,000. I would never take anything less than $50,000 from anyone. Right. Well, one of the techniques I learned from a founder was you always capture everybody's interest or commitment in addition to their investment. And then if you add it all up, you can communicate that to the other investors saying, look, all the interest and commitment is well over our, our remaining amount. Uh, they could come in before you and start to show that, you know, there is true scarcity here. I have people that are thinking and circling at this level. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's fine. We're going to be doing that on Thursday with Thrive to that. Um, <laughs> we've already had 2.5 million. We need another half a million haul. Do you want to come in behind this number one investor, you know, or, you know, this one person that will be relinquishing? I can't be on a tight NDA, but you know what I mean? It's either yes or no at that point. It's either yes or no. It's the, That's all it is. And I agree wholeheartedly. What you want to do is you really want to make sure that you commit to them say, look, I have this soft circle. These guys are going to fund soon. These guys who everyone who, but you also have to add a little bit of legitimacy too. You have to say, Look, all the guys that are soft circled here, they've already invested in at least one or two of my other deals. So I know they're going to come in. There's a reason the certainty, certainty of execution here that they're actually going to write the check. And that's, you know, how I would improve upon that. You ever use existing investors' names as part of the pitch or you get a permission or how, how does that work? When, when do you use that? Uh, we when have you to ask, yeah. So that's the whole reason why tomorrow's Zoom won't be called uh, recorded. Um, because we have to use permission, but we can't have it recorded. I do when we're talking with uh, families, they want to know who the other family offices are. And I have to say, this is, you know, we have to disclose who the other investors are, the top investors, not smaller investors, but the top investors for this, because that uh, means that they're, you know, as I said before, the cap table is the soul of the asset, right? And when you're on top of this and you're working with these, um, with, with your investors, they want that they want to know that right up front, right? They don't want to know, you know, who who's the smart ones in the family. I'm sorry, who are the smart people, the investors now who are investing into this? And are there, are there any synergies, right? So you always want like a real estate family investing with other real estate families in the real estate deals, right? I mean, that's how New York was sort of built. Um, the same thing today. You always want people to have commonality and able to provide a little bit more than just, um, cap, you know, equity capital, but also reputational and um, strategic capital too. I mean, if there's a lead investor, they usually have done substantial diligence. If you can get a copy of that, would you use that with other investors? Say the diligence is already done. It's right here. You can get access to it if you're serious about it, you know, in over 100K, something like that. Would that be a, a carrot in, or would that be a stick? Uh, that is definitely a carrot because they want to see the due diligence there. If I said that this diligence is coming from one of the larger families who has a $240 million investment into SpaceX, yeah, that's going to go far. Would you put a limit on that? You only only 100k and above can get that. 50k is you know they don't get that. Yeah, I would say no. Yeah, I, everything has to be sort of qualified. So for 100k, yes, you can see the diligence room. You can see everything that's there. That's how I know you're serious. But I need you to make sure you understand before I send this to you, Hall. This is very classified. If you go through this, you only have one week to go through it. I'm lifting the password off for one week. After that, you know, you know, we'll part ways, friends, and you can still get the Christmas cards. Great, great. Uh, 